It's hard because we're living in a dopamine overloaded world where everything has become drugified. Everything has been made more accessible, more abundant, more potent, more reinforcing, more novel. And so we're really living in a world that has turned us all into addicts, essentially. Um, plus our primitive wiring that's not really evolved for that ecosystem. And to understand sort of how we get out of that adaptive, healthy seeking of dopamine and fall into that maladaptive, addictive seeking of dopamine, it's really important to understand that pleasure and pain work like a balance in the brain and that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain. Okay, so if you imagine that in your brain, there's a balance like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground, okay? And when we experience pleasure, it tips one way, and when we experience pain, it tips the opposite way. And one of the overarching rules governing that balance is that it wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. So when we do something pleasurable, okay, so in my, in my case, that might be reading a romance novel or eating a piece of chocolate or um, my morning cup of coffee, what happens is that I, I, I get a little release of dopamine in a part of our brain called the reward pathway, and my balance tips to the side of pleasure. But no sooner has it done that than my brain will try to restore a level balance by down-regulating dopamine production and dopamine transmission, not just to baseline levels, but below baseline levels. So, and I imagine that as these little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance that bring it level again, but they like it on the balance. So they stay on until it's tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the after effect, the hangover, or that moment of wanting you know, one more cup of coffee or, you know, wanting that novel not to end or wanting to watch one more episode. Now, if we wait long enough, those neuroadaptation gremlins hop off and baseline dopamine levels are restored. But if we don't wait, if we continue to consume our drug of choice repeatedly over days to weeks to months to years, we end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of the balance to fill this whole room. In other words, we end up with a pleasure pain balance that has a new hedonic or joy set point. It's now chronically tilted to the side of pain because those gremlins are camped out there and we are in a dopamine deficit state. In other words, to compensate for the increase in dopamine in our brain's reward pathway beyond what our brain has evolved to deal with, we essentially go into this chronic dopamine deficit state. And once we're in that state, we are struggling with the addicted brain. And then we need our drug not to feel good, but just to restore a level of balance and feel normal. And when we're not using, we're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and intrusive thoughts of wanting to use. So the internet has really turned us all into people struggling with compulsive overconsumption on a number of different levels. First of all, the device itself is quite reinforcing. Screens are like primitive fires that we are drawn toward and, and gather around. The kind of tapping and swiping I think really taps into, no pun intended, um, our sort of primitive desire to use our hands in repetitive ways. Um, the phone itself is, you know, indeed a portal to drugs that have been around forever. Like I can use this phone to order cocaine to my doorstep, like ordering a pizza, right? Yeah. But it's also made drugs that have been around for a long time, but were harder to get, like pornography, much, much more accessible. So starting, you know, in the early 2000s, I started to see more and more men in particular come in with debilitating pornography addiction. And almost universally they said it was the internet, the advent of the internet and the phone that made these graphic images and then ultimately live people so accessible that really then conspired to make what had been a manageable use of pornography or masturbation into a compulsive, you know, debilitating life-threatening problem. And then finally, 
the internet has created drugs that literally did not exist before, things like video games. And yes, games have been around forever, but you know, the internet and the, the screen and the software have allowed for these incredibly vivid experiences that are really unlike you know, anything that you would find in, in real life. Social media too, so human connection is healthy and adaptive, but social media manages to take the healthy aspects of human connection and potentially drugify them with you know, the bright lights, the curated profiles, the beautiful images, the bottomless bowls, the likes, the rankings when we enumerate things. Uh, we make them more potent, they release more dopamine. So for all these reasons, a very exciting, wonderful technology really does have this dark underbelly.